Welcome to Core TV Live. I'm Julia Janae in for Julie Grant this morning. Thanks for being with us. The double murder trial for the disgraced attorney Alec Murdoch will resume tomorrow morning in Colleton County, South Carolina. Court is in recess for President's Day. The prosecution rested their case in chief on Friday after they called 61 total witnesses to the stand over the course of this week's long trial. And the focus now is on the defense. They're expected to call members of the Murdoch family once court is back in session. And once those family members take the stand, one of those we should hear from is the lone surviving son of Alex, Buster Murdoch. That elder son of the defendant, he's consistently been sitting in the courtroom there in the gallery. You see him. He's been mostly quiet on the details of this case. We want to recap those highlights for you from both the prosecution and the defense so far. Let's start off with the top five best forms of evidence that have been presented by the prosecution in this case. Starting at the bottom of our list, number five, is Alec Murdoch's timeline of events. The state has gashed a lot of holes in his alibi, which centered around a trip to his mother's house in Almeida, which he stated came before the Slanks. It's a trip which is approximately 13 miles from the family's hunting lodge in Moselle. The scene of the crime, that's where the son and wife of Alec Murdoch were found. Here's a look back at the moments, the or movements rather, via his OnStar data through General Motors that was collected from his vehicle. We're at where Alex is leaving for Almeida. This is gonna be 9.07.06 p.m. So the orange dot, that's gonna represent approximately where Maggie Murdoch's phone was located. I tried to call her when I left, <coughs> texted her. No response. It's going to be 908, 36 seconds, and it's showing a speed of 42 miles an hour. After passing that location, as the defendant's vehicle start to accelerate? It does. I was at the house. I left the house and went to my mom's <clears throat> for just a little while. This is going to be the Almeda property, but it's showing at 92206, the Suburban's point making a uh, left into the Almeda property. So on the bottom you have Almeda um, going through Varnville and then heading up to Moselle. This is at 9.51.30. This is showing an approximate speed of 74 miles an hour. So this is gonna be the arrival into Moselle. This is showing 10 o'clock on the dot, showing seven miles an hour, uh, making a left into the main driveway. This is gonna be a timestamp of 10.05.06 p.m. And this is showing um, Alex Murdoch leaving for the, the kennels. When I got back to the house, the house was obviously nobody was in there. So I figured they're still up here fooling around. Top speed was what? Um, 80.16 miles an hour. And at this time period, would it have been dark outside? It would. Top speeds on both the trip to and from Almeida in excess of his any max speed in his trips previous in the day. That'd be correct. Another key point has been Paul Murdoch's cell phone calls. Witnesses have testified that he was normally very active on his phone, a 22-year-old. Here you see Paul communicating with Megan Kimbrough starting at 8.29 p.m. on June 7, 2021. He also spoke with Rogan Gibson at 8.40 p.m. while still texting Kimbrough before all communication from Paul stopped before 8.50 p.m. Now, joining us now in New York, a former senior homicide prosecutor, Bernardo Villalona, and in Minneapolis, Minnesota, criminal defense attorney Joe Tamburino is with us to talk about this. This is number five on our list, Joe and Bernardo. Bernardo, let me start with you. When you hear this timeline, 907 of Alec Murdoch driving away from his property, and on Friday, the coroner said the time of death is nine o'clock. How damaging is that for their case, as far as the defense case, when you have such a clear-seeming timeline? So what the coroner's testimony, even though it was the defense attorney that called the coroner, I didn't give it much weight because the coroner didn't use the most specific way of trying to figure out what time of death. The way that he determined the time of death is by placing his hand without a glove underneath the armpit of Paul Murdoch where they say that the most specific way and accurate way to do it is by using a thermometer. So I didn't put much weight into his testimony because either way, when you take the totality of the circumstances in terms of the cell phone and when it uh, stops the usage of the cell phone, I think that's where you get the accurate time of death. So it's still very damning for the defense. I think it's very strong evidence 
for the prosecution and that timeline, like you stated before, they really destroyed the alibi of, of Alec Murdoch. You know, the defense doesn't argue, Joe, much with this timeline. It kind of jives with theirs because they were able to get the coroner to admit that 8 to 10 p.m. could be the time of death. But as Bernardo said, that contradicts the cell phone activity. Uh, the 80 miles per hour on that drive from Al uh, Moselle to Almeida, do you think that's significant? Is that going to stand out for this jury that he was driving so fast or is it just a country road? No, it's going to be very significant. Good morning and thanks for having me on. Absolutely going that kind of speed in that area shows that he was going somewhere very much in a hurry. But we know this about the time of death, and I just wanted to mention that when you guys were talking about it. We know that the kennel video was approximately 8.44, 8.45 p.m. that night. And we know that obviously he's on the move. Uh, Mr. Murdoch at some time a little after nine o'clock. So most likely the murder happened within that time frame. And we also know that they didn't find the two guns. And that time frame gives Mr. Murdoch enough time to go from the kennel back to his home and stash the two guns because they never searched the house. We have no idea where those guns are. They could have been disposed of later on. So there's plenty of time for him to do the murders, then get into the suburban and then drive 80 miles an hour. And some of the things that you're mentioning are actually on our list. We'll see where they pop up on the list. But I do want to talk about our number four on the list of best prosecution evidence. And that's Alec Murdoch's missing clothes. Now, we know the defendant did an outfit change between the time Maggie and Paul were killed and when police showed up. Now, just minutes before the alleged murders, he was recorded on Paul's Snapchat like this. And later that night, when police arrived, he was looking like this in a white T-shirt, shorts, and sneakers. So a different outfit than he had then. And Murdoch's housekeeper, Blanca Simpson, said that he later brought up the clothing to her. Take a listen. He walked in um, to the little house, and I was almost, I was getting ready to leave. And um, he said, B, I need to talk to you. And uh, he said, come here, sit down. So I went in the living room, I sat down, and he was pacing back and forth in the, in the living room. And he said, I got a bad feeling. He said, I got a bad feeling. He said, something's not right. And then he said, um, he said well, you know, um, there's a, um, a video. There was a video that was out. I hadn't seen a video. And he said, you remember the shirt I was wearing, that Vinnie Vine shirt? Those were, that's what he said to me. And uh, in my mind, I was saying, I don't remember a Vinnie Vine's shirt. It was the polo shirt. I don't remember him wearing that shirt that day when he left. I know what shirt he was wearing because I fixed the collar. And the collar's a different material. When he left that day, was he wearing a Vinnie Vine shirt? Or was he wearing the collar you've described? It was... A, Polo shirt. Oh, I was basically confused. I didn't really know whether he was trying to get me to say that that shirt was if I was if I was to be asked that if that was a shirt he was wearing the day. After that, sled agent David Owen collected Alec Murdoch's clothes from that night, and he testified that though the items could hold clues, or he believed that these items could hold clues about the killings. You'd reached out to Alec, me, John Marvin, any, whenever you need to go on property to do anything, and you always got consent, correct? That is correct. And anything you ask, for the most part, um, it was provided? Yes. At no time prior to August the 11th, 2021, did you ask Alec Murdoch, where's that blue shirt, where are those khaki pants, where are those shoes, did you? No, sir, I did not. And you have never asked him for that blue shirt, those tan shoes and those khaki pants, have you? No, sir. And the reason you didn't, because you weren't concerned about those clothes, your investigation been focused since early June on the T-shirt he was wearing 
the shorts he was wearing and the shoes he was wearing at the time he called 911, right? Yes. Joe, we pulled out this moment. I want to ask you, where do you think it falls, uh, in your opinion? Is this going to be important information for the jury when it comes to those missing clothes? Or in light of all of the evidence, are they going to focus on this? Definitely they're going to focus on this because it's one of these situations where you have a defendant trying to get a witness to change their story or to implant a memory in that witness. That's horrible for the defense. You never want to have that. You never want to have a client where there's evidence against him or her that they're trying to implant some knowledge or a memory in another witness. So I think the jury will focus on this. But Bernardo, there's an issue. The investigators didn't ask for it initially, and that seems to be something the defense is bringing up over and over again during their cross-examination. Yeah, so while the law enforcement officers didn't ask for it, remember that Alex Murdoch provided a timeline inside of that vehicle of what he did that night. And guess was it, what was it a part of that timeline? The changing of his clothes, and that would have been important to have mentioned. So while the law enforcement didn't know to ask for it, and let's be real, they didn't know to ask for it until they found out about the video and seeing the changing of clothes. But by that time, it was too late. I think the lack, the omission from Alex Murdoch, that would be damning for the defense. And that's why it's a strong piece of evidence for the prosecution, the changing of clothes, because regardless, the clothes that uh, from that night when law enforcement uh, responded there and he had the white T-shirt, they checked those clothes and there was no sign of blood. There was no sign of, of DNA. There was no sign of inside of the, the bottom of the sneakers of any pellets or parts of that crime scene. And yet he said he walked to the crime scene and he also checked on the pulse. I think it's huge. I really do. Uh, thank you both for your insight. Don't go anywhere. We have a lot more to come, including the top three on our list of the prosecution's best evidence. He said, you remember the shirt I was wearing, that Vinnie Vines shirt? In my mind, I was saying, I don't remember a Vinnie Vines shirt. Joe mentioned this briefly. Why was Alex Murdoch trying to coach his housekeeper about what he was wearing the day of the murders? Plus, the cell phone video that places Alec Murdoch at the crime scene moments before Maggie and Paul were killed. That's ahead. The trial that America is watching. Disbarred lawyer Alec Murdoch is accused of shooting his son Paul and his wife Maggie. They're on the ground out at my kennel. Prosecutors say a financial house of cards was collapsing around him. Financial, digital, and forensic evidence. It looked like he had stolen. A big trial in a small southern town. Pow, pow. He did it so bad. The Murdoch Family Murders. Live coverage today on Court TV. Hi. A decade of malfeasance and misappropriation. And when we look at June 7th in particular, at that point in time, he's out of options. For the jury to really understand what's going on, they have to understand the full picture of what this man has been doing and what he's been trying to hide. When the hounds are at the door, when Hannibal's at the gates for Alec Murdoch, violence happens. Back to Court TV Live and back to our list of the top five pieces of evidence in the state's case against disgraced attorney Alec Murdoch. We're at number three, and that's did this defendant coach witnesses? That's the allegation of the prosecution. Murdoch allegedly tried to tell his mother's caretaker and his housekeeper what they really saw on the night that Paul and Maggie were killed. Now, Alex's alibi was that he was at his mother's home, she has dementia, on the night in question. But the timing is the issue. Let's take a look at the testimony from his mother's caretaker, Shelly Smith, who testified that Alex said things to her on her story that seemed to be coaching. He was telling you or saying to you that he was at the house? Mm -hmm. When? Um, the night of the murders. The, the night. night of the murders? Yes. What was he telling you about that he was at the house the night of the murders? That he'd been there 30 to 40 minutes. Was he there 30 or 40 minutes that night? Not to my recall. Why are you crying, Mr. Smith? Because he's a good, fam a good family and I love working there. And I'm sorry all this happened. They're good people, you know. 
But he wasn't there in no 30 or 40 minutes, was he? No. no. Can't lead the witness. Then Murdoch's housekeeper, Blanca Simpson, also said that the defendant, Alec Murdoch, tried to tweak her story about his clothing. Let me, let me talk to you a little bit about this conversation in August of, of 21 after the murders. Yes, sir. Mr. Uh, Alec came over and uh, was inquiring of you what shirt he had on that day, correct? It didn't feel like he was inquiring. It felt more like he was trying to convince me of the shirt that he was wearing. So with us in New York, former senior homicide prosecutor Bernardo Villalona and in Minneapolis, Minnesota, criminal defense attorney Joe Tamburino. Bernardo, Shelley Smith was a compelling witness and her demeanor said a lot. Tell me what you thought about how she presented on the stand. I actually felt bad for her because she was very uncomfortable having to testify before everyone. She was very uncomfortable because she felt like she was actually betraying the family as opposed to just coming in there and just telling the truth about what she remembered, what she saw, what she heard, and what was told to her. But she did come off very credible. Uh, what's more concerning to me about that statement that Alex Murdoch made to her is that, remember, she's also the one that does provide information to law enforcement about that blue raincoat or that blue tarp, whatever you want to call it, but the blue thing with GSR on it. Mm -hmm. That was a big part. On the defense side, really, it's going to make our list at some point. We'll see where it falls. But, Joe, I want to ask you about Shelly Smith, because there was the other piece to it that Alec Murdoch mentioned that, oh, you're getting married, right? Uh, you may need money. If you need something, it gets expensive. Let me know. He also wanted to know how she was doing in school, if she needed help after she got out of school to get a position. I mean, that can go even further than just coaching, could it not? Yes, it could, because we know that Alex Murda has paid people a lot of money over the years, specifically his cousin, Eddie, um, you know, with that whole situation. And so what you do is you combine the one him trying to influence a witness as to what she remembered, implanting a memory, trying to coax her, and number two, giving her an incentive for her to agree with him. What's the incentive? Well, clearly money, because obviously she's a house worker and she might need extra money for different things. So both of those things are really damning for the defense. And I want to mention this, Bernardo. I mean, it's part of this case. You can't really get around it, but tell me how you think it'll impact the jury. We're talking about a big name there in a small town. Someone whose name many have reported strikes fear in the hearts of people when they think about the amount of power that this family had. This is a case that the venue didn't change. So some of those emotions attached to a name or some of that recognition could still be there in the jury room. Is that a problem? Uh, absolutely, it's a problem. Remember the defense, it was a strategy for the defense that didn't even ask for a change of venue because they're hoping that the Murdoch name has some influence and also has a history in the mind of these jurors and to them, they believe that it will be beneficial, the history of the Murdoch name, because it's a name that comes with prestige and wealth and of goodness and of law enforcement. Because remember that they have decades of being solicitors for that very county. So in terms of what may happen in that jury room, I think it's still going to play a role, whether it's subconsciously or not. Joe, do you think it's a positive or negative when you're looking at this from the prosecution's standpoint that they are still there in Colleton County and you have this person who may either have a powerful name that people respect or one that they secretly don't really care for? I think it's going to be a positive because what the prosecution is saying, it could be anywhere. We're going to keep this case here where it happened because we trust the local population. However, you also notice that the prosecution did not go for the death penalty. I believe right now there are either 30 or 35 people awaiting death in South Carolina. Um, the last one I think that was scheduled to go was by firing squad and then the appellate court stopped it. So they didn't go for death in this case. They clearly could have. But the prosecutor probably thought, well, because he's so well known in his family, same things that you were just discussing, they didn't go for death. Excellent points. And we're going to talk more about it and get to number two on our list. How are Maggie and Paul's murders linked to millions of dollars allegedly stolen by Alec Murdoch? The state hopes the jurors are going to connect the dots between his financial crimes and their deaths. 
And later, Murdoch's defense team zeroes in on crime scene investigation problems and mistakes they say that were made. Also, we're taking a look at what people in Walterboro think about the case so far. Our crime and justice correspondent Matt Johnson is live there in Colleton County working on President's Day. Matt, what can you tell us? Yeah, hi, JJ. So we're here over at the Old House Cafe in Walterboro, the front, front porch seat to the low country. We're getting people's opinion, strong opinions, along with the coffee coming up on Court TV. The trial that America is watching. Disbarred lawyer Alec Murdoch is accused of shooting his son Paul and his wife Maggie. They're on the ground out at my kennel. Prosecutors say a financial house of cards was collapsing around him. Financial, digital, and forensic evidence. It looked like he had stolen. A big trial in a small southern town. Ow, ow. It is so bad. The Murdoch Family Murders. Live coverage today on Court TV. I've certainly read a lot and um, listened to a lot, so. What's your thoughts on that? Oh, he's guilty, uh, period. Welcome back to Court TV Live. This hour, we are breaking down the top five moments for the prosecution in the Murdoch family murders trial. Which witnesses made the most impact and which piece of evidence really hurt the defense? We are up to our top five. Two. And next hour, the defense's top five moments are coming up so far from their case. What are those unforgettable cross-examination wins and the possible reasonable doubt that they've raised? We're going to go from number five to number one on their case as well. You won't want to miss it. But before we get back to that list, we want to check in in Walterboro, South Carolina with Court TV crime and justice correspondent Matt Johnson. He's live at the Old House Cafe. Matt, you're there talking to people about the trial so far. Yeah, uh, we sure are talking, and uh, they're starting to eat over here, and I'm making me hungry, Roger. Well, go get you something. They got plenty <laughs> of food here. <laughs> we were talking during the commercial break. How long you live here? Most of my life. And have you ever seen anything like this with all the media coming to town? This is a small uh, town. This is a lot for this town, it really is. And that's all you hear about around here. Yeah. So did, did it surprise you when you saw a big TV crew here this morning when you're just trying to mind your own and, and eat your breakfast? Um, kind of, yeah. <laughs> what do you think about it all? I'll be glad when it's over myself. Yeah? And how are you leaning so far? Have you, have you been following it at all? Some. some. Yeah. But I, I'll just be glad when it's all over with. Whether he's guilty or not guilty, just be done with it. What were your initial thoughts and what are you thinking right now? <laughs> just from what you've heard. I don't know. I'm not going to say. No? No. All right, Roger. We'll leave you to it. What'd you get? Sausage and grits and eggs. Yeah, you said a country breakfast. Country breakfast. All right. Enjoy, my friend. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to come over here. What's your name? Lisa Wood. And what's your name, sir? Rick Wood. How long do you guys live here in Walterboro or in the area? Well, we actually live in St. George. Uh, we've lived there three years, but we've been in the low country for uh, 30 years. Uh, Air Force brought me here in 92. Thank you for your service. Um, talk to me about the trial and, and just uh, the nature of all the media being here and, and it kind of putting Walterboro on the map a little bit, low country. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of, a lot of uh, congestion and pressure around the courthouse, but for the rest of it, you know, it's not too bad. Uh, it, uh, it gets the name out there. It's a great place to be. It's, it's a beautiful area, friendly people, uh, nice place to live. What was your initial thoughts when um, Maggie and Paul were killed and we didn't know who did it, there was no arrest? I really don't have any initial thoughts on it, but if you just asked me if I thought he did it, I think he did. Have you been following the trial at all? Has anything stuck out to you? Um, just the way he acts when he in court. I just think that he, he has some... <clears throat> guilt. Yeah. Expand on that a little bit. Is it the emotion that he shares every time they talk about Paul? Absolutely, the, the emotion. Um, 
I, I just think he did it. And I, I don't, do I think, he'll, I think he'll get away and not. Why is that? Um, because he knew too many people in Walterboro area and. Did he know you? No. <laughs> he, uh. It's just such a small area. I think that the, it would have done better if the trial had gone outside of the area. And what's the biggest piece of evidence for you, sir? Uh, a lot of the technology, cell phone data, and a lot of the forensics that they have come up with uh, and shown, uh, at least what we see on the local newscast, because we don't go to the, the courtroom or anything, but uh, the technology really is, is kind of damning to me, uh, pinging cell phones and things of that nature. And what would you be listening for with the defense team as we're really revving it up? They've only had two witnesses and they were very short witnesses on Friday. So what are you looking to hear from them? Is there anything that could change your mind? Um, yeah, it's possible. I mean, you have to come up with a, a plausible explanation for the way things uh, occurred with his his wardrobe and his... Hi, Lynn. Oh, uh, hi. <laughs> his, uh, you know, changing the wardrobe uh, in the middle of it to, to the photographic evidence they have of that. Uh, they, they have to disprove that the, his cell phone wasn't where they said it was. So we'll see. All right. Thank you very much. Your food just arrived over here. Lynn is the Sorry, best uh, waitress. Um, now, in short, you know, what are your thoughts about, what's your name? Um, Lisa. Lisa, what are your thoughts about all of this commotion in town? You have a news crew here when you're trying to enjoy breakfast. Yeah. The only thing I have to say, he ought to just come out and tell the truth. That's all I got to say. And then, what's your favorite part of Walterboro, in case, you know, people haven't been here before? Walterboro? Yeah. You know, just in a hole. And that's pretty much the feeling here. It's a small town where everybody knows everybody. Everybody knows the Murdochs. And, uh, you know, we're just trying to enjoy the day, right, on, on this holiday. Again, thanks for your service, and we'll send it back to you guys in the studio. Thanks, Matt, so much. Excellent reporting. And, gosh, what good insight from those folks and views. We appreciate it. Thank you. As we continue our countdown on the top five best forms of evidence presented by the prosecution, number two is the motive that the state has tried to tie Alec Murdoch's numerous financial crimes to the crime that they say he committed against his son and his wife. And there were up to 10 witnesses paraded in who testified in front of this jury on the many details of these misdealings as the state pushes to draw a connection between his faulty finances and the murders of his wife's son. Pushing to draw that connection, is it actually going to work? Here's an inside look into Alec Murdoch's wide web of monetary affairs. He admitted and, and, and said that he was, knew he was going to get caught at some point in time. Former colleagues and friends of once prominent attorney Alec Murdoch have taken the stand to peel back the veil of the attorney's lavish lifestyle supplied by the finances allegedly stolen from clients. I think Alec um, was successful more off, not from his work ethic, but from his ability to establish relationships and to, to manipulate people into settlements and clients into liking him. Um, so he did it through the art of basically. The financial house of cards Murdoch spent a decade building was beginning to collapse, allegedly stealing an estimated five million from his former law firm. November, December of 20, late 20, that's when he started making some, some disbursements that he was stealing from that started getting sloppy. The former attorney is also accused of stealing a $3.4 million insurance payout meant for the family of his deceased housekeeper, Gloria Satterfield. After her family sued him, Murdoch admitted responsibility. Did he say anything about how much money you may receive? Um, the goal was to get me and my brother Brian at least $100,000 apiece. It's unknown where the millions funneled to Alec Murdoch went. According to the testimony of Palmetto State Bank CEO Jan Malinowski, Murdoch owed $4.2 million. But according to friends and family, it didn't stop his spending. The original price was $9,188 for the for the two firearms that they 
Buster and Paul got for Christmas in 2016, correct? Yes, sir. Murdoch invested in property during the recession of 2008, creating a strain on his finances. In 2021, Murdoch took out a $91,368 loan for Maggie's Mercedes SUVs and spent over $10,000 on 300 caliber blackout rifles. Their low country estate, over 1,700 acres, was lavished with housekeepers, vehicles, and animals, including their Labradors, Bubba, Bourbon, and Grady. The Murdoch home was a place for friends and family to gather, but after a 2018 boating incident involving Paul, Murdoch's financial debt came to light. You could tell something that it was the boat crash was weighing heavy on him and he was, it was consuming his life almost. He was going to have to pay 10 million out of his pocket. And did the defense have any response to you eventually? That he might could cobble together a million dollars. But did he have any broke. other response? He was broke. His best friend, Chris Wilson, testified he saw no red flags indicating any kind of money issues the Murdochs may have. That he was you know, one of the biggest dogs in that firm, one of the biggest producers they had. Um, you know, seemed to own a lot of things, do a lot of things, spend money, did never seem to have problems. The prosecution said in opening statements, Murdoch burned through his cash like crazy and was out of options, leading him to kill Maggie and Paul to distract from the alleged financial crimes he was facing. But will the financial motive be enough to convince a jury of 12 beyond a reasonable doubt and find Murdoch guilty of murdering his family? She felt that Alec was not being truthful to her with regard to what exactly was going on with that lawsuit. She said, he doesn't tell me everything. Still with us to talk about this in New York, former senior homicide prosecutor Bernardo Villalona and in Minneapolis, Minnesota, criminal defense attorney Joe Tamburino. I have the same question for both of you. Starting with you, Bernarda, we have this at number two. Do you agree with where we have placed this on our list as far as this motive that the prosecution fought tooth and nail to get in? But also, if you were prosecuting this case, would you have presented this same evidence? Well, I definitely would have presented evidence if it's available. So financial crimes, yes, it can be a motive. Is it a motive where all 12 jurors will believe that beyond a reasonable doubt that Alex Murdoch took out his wife as well as his son as a result of this? I don't know. What I would spin it as if I were the prosecutor is like, look, I didn't have to present motive to you. I don't have to prove motive to you. However, I did present the motive to you and that being the financial crimes. But I'll say this, if you don't believe it, Still, look at the evidence. You don't have to believe that I proved that to be the motive. You can look at the evidence and still find him guilty separate and apart from the motive. Because I don't think it's going to fly for all 12 jurors that financial crime was the basis of him taking out two loved ones. You know, it's not a clear one. It's not one of those motives where you say, oh, they did it for the money. Oh, they did it because of a cheating spouse. It's not that clear. Joe, your take on where this should fall, how important it is, but also what you would have done if you were prosecuting this case. Well, as a prosecutor, clearly you would have gone to these prior bad acts. There's no doubt about it. However, this will be the major issue on appeal. If he loses and gets convicted, his number one issue is going to be this 404B under the rules of evidence, pieces of evidence. I mean, as you just displayed, 10 witnesses came up and testified. It was like having a fraud trial in the middle of a double homicide trial, double murder trial. And I think the judge let in too much of this evidence. You could let in some motive evidence for sure, but we basically had a major multi-million dollar fraud trial within this double murder trial. This will be the issue on appeal. I actually have a follow-up question for you, Joe, but I first want to play uh, some sound from Mark Tinsley. He was the attorney for the family of Mallory Beach, the victim in that boat crash in 2019. Take a listen. Generally, at this point in time, what was your assessment of the defendant, the, how lucrative the defendant's practice was and his general wealth? I believe that uh, he was making lots of money. I told you that, that he had most of the cases. So if that's 50% or 60% of the cases that are actively resolving, he's actively making money. Money's coming in. 
Now, whether I knew this, that how the, the law firm worked in terms of they would get their money at the end of the year, that's not uncommon. But it doesn't really change the fact that he's making lots of money. And, and, and that didn't really change in the time that I knew him. It certainly hadn't changed in the years immediately preceding the boat crash. You know, so by the last three to five years. Part of the case, it's a compelling story. I want to know if you would have perhaps sectioned off just the boat crash, or is there a portion of this? Because the financial misdealings spanned multiple stories, multiple victims, multiple types of financial misdealings. Would you have just limited to the boat crash? Well, for purposes of appeal, um, you could have done that. Yes, you could have. But the, Judge Newman was letting the prosecutor get into all of these things. So, you know, from the standpoint of the prosecutor, and remember, we're an adversarial system. The defense and the prosecution go at it. So if you got the winning hand and the judge is letting you get into this evidence, you'll keep going. And that's basically what happened here. Joe Tamarino and Bernardo Villalona standing by for us, giving us this insight on our top five list. Don't go anywhere. We are going to fit in a break. Next, it took investigators nine months to unlock Paul Murdoch's cell phone. And when they did, they found a video that no one even knew existed that placed Alec Murdoch at the crime scene moments before the murders. <laughs> It's a guinea. We believe it's the state's best evidence, but will it be enough to convince a jury that he did it? We'll break it down next. I thought, this is really bizarre. A wealthy businessman loses the love of his wife. He was not going to accept the fact that she was sleeping with someone else. And then loses control. He poured gasoline on his body and set him on fire. The tale of a love triangle that ended in tragedy. Every murder comes down to one or two things. It's either profit or passion. Someone they knew with Tamron Hall. All new episode tonight, 7, 6 Central. Oh, I got up, I called Maggie, didn't get an answer, and I think I texted her. What does that text say? It says, going to check on him, be right back. I left to go to my mom's. She had said she might ride with me, but she normally doesn't. So is there anybody that you can think of that we need to talk to tonight? I mean, I can't tell you anybody that I'm overly suspicious of. This hour, we have focused on the top five best forms of evidence presented by the prosecution against disgraced attorney Alec Murdoch. The trial we've been following for four weeks now there in South Carolina. And now it's time for number one, Paul's cell phone video at the kennels. Get back. Get back. Quit, Cash. Come on. Quit. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Cash. Cash. Hey, he's got a bird in his mouth. Bubba. Hey, Bubba. It's a guinea. This is a chicken. Come here, Bubba. Come here, Bubba. Cash. Come here, Bubba. Cash. Quit. Just around a minute long, but yet so potentially damning against this defendant. Alec Murdoch denied that he was at the scene around the time of the murders, but this video was taken by his late son, Paul, was likely unknown by him and his defense team. You don't see Alec Murdoch's face, but several witnesses identified his voice during their testimony. He said he thought it was me. Was it you? At, at 9 o'clock? Yes, sir. No, sir. Not if my times are right. Recognize Paul's voice? Yes, sir. Do you recognize Maggie's voice? Yes, sir. 
You recognize Alex's voice? Yes, sir. Uh, Paul Murdahl, Maggie Murdahl, and Alex Murdahl. It's Paul, Maggie, Alec. I hear Paul Murdoch, Maggie Murdoch, and Alec Murdoch. Paul Murdoch, Maggie Murdoch, and Alec Murdoch. Was the defendant clear about whether or not he had gone back down to the kennels after he went to the house? No, sir. Was he clear that he had not gone back down? Yes, sir. Well, that was clear. He hadn't gone down there. That was clear. Actually. Still with us in New York, former senior homicide prosecutor Bernardo Villalona and in Minneapolis, Minnesota, criminal defense attorney Joe Tamburino to talk about our number one, Paul's kennel video. Bernardo, I know you prosecuted many, many, many cases in your time. Uh, can you tell me what the process is to authenticate a video like this in front of the jury? Yes, and I have to say I agree with Court TV that this is the number one most damning piece of evidence that the prosecution has against Alex Murdoch, that being that kennel video. So in terms of authenticating the video, usually with authenticating the video, you'll have the person that actually took the video. The problem here, as you can see, that Paul Murdoch is dead, so you have to find other ways of authenticating the video. So in terms of the video, the cell phone being dumped and they receiving the information from the cell phone, they were able to bring that evidence in. But now you got to authenticate what's inside of the video in terms of what are the voices? Can anyone recognize those voices? And as you can see, the prosecution was able to bring at least four witnesses that are very familiar with the voice of Alex Murdoch to say that that is his voice, especially since you do not see his face. That's why it was so important for the audio to be authenticated and prosecution was able to do that. And as you can see, key crucial evidence against Alex Murdoch. Joe, one of the biggest problems is this defendant claimed he was not at the kennels that evening. And you saw there that he's in that interview with an attorney, a civil attorney of his, a longtime friend, while police are questioning him. He doesn't know about that video on his son's phone. Probably didn't even know his son was filming. I know you have had a lot of issue with the attorney that was sitting there during that statement. Fill us in. Yes, um, he was a civil attorney, but he's still an attorney and he should know this. Don't give any statements unless you know exactly what the evidence is in a case, unless you know exactly what's going to come at you. Why are you serving up your client by giving a statement like that? Now, there are occasions where you do go to the police with your client because basically you know exactly what the client's going to say. You pretty much know what the evidence is. But in a case like this, where you've got alibi, which means timing's going to be important, where you have vehicles moving around, where you have two dead bodies, uh, this is not something that you just willy nilly walk in your client and say, sure, question him. And this civil attorney also made another mistake when he was sitting there saying, well, are you questioning him as a, as a suspect? Do you suspect him of anything? I mean, what do you think? You're bringing in your client to talk to a cop. Of course he's a suspect. It just should never have happened. It happened, and it was in front of the jury for the state's case. Now we are on the defense case. They've called two witnesses so far, and we'll see who all they bring to the stand in the coming weeks.